Hi, and welcome to the Changing Perspectives podcast, the show where we discuss a variety of topics, including grief, parenting, pop culture, and relationships. Join us and explore a number of changing perspectives. We're your hosts, Jenny and Josh Brennan. Hi, Jenny. Hi. Good morning. Nope. What time is it? It's oh. like one o'clock. Well, who knows when you're listening to mm-hmm. this? It could be morning for people. Good True. morning, good afternoon, good evening. Happy 2 a.m. You have no idea what time people are listening. True point. Right? Mm-hmm. True point. As Hi our niece everybody. says. Hi, everybody. And welcome to episode 71. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hope you enjoy the last episode all about gaming and gaming addiction. Uh, I enjoyed it. You didn't really enjoy all the history part, though. Uh, no, but now if I'm ever on like Jeopardy, maybe I will know that Pong was the first video game. And you know that the uh, uh, founder of Atari also founded Chuck E. Cheese. That's right. Yeah. Life skills. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, um, how are you today? I am good. We are sort of breaking the fourth wall. We're not live streaming this episode, no. but we are beta testing a new, a new thing, which is echoing over there. Um, but, or maybe it's echoing it here for me. Oh, you do the headphones down yeah, there? Yeah, we're we're beta testing. We'll see how that goes. So there may be an exciting new live uh, testing option. Can you turn that down on the on the headphones? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Let me see. Well, here you you talk while okay. I while I do that. Well, I wanted to invite everyone to sign up for Jenny's newsletter. Um, check out jennybrennan.com and you can sign up for the newsletter, which has all kinds of great content and blog articles and links to products and also um podcast links actually links to podcast episodes so if you haven't done so already go sign up for jenny's newsletter and i also wanted to invite to invite folks to rate us and review us on itunes the more you do that the more opportunity more people have to get changing perspectives more the more audience we reach we also will feature your brand new review over the air. Um, we will read new reviews over the air, even if they're not so great. If you have some constructive feedback for us, uh, let us know and we can uh, read those over the air. How's it going over there? We're going to, I think that concludes our beta testing. What was the issue? Well, I feel like there might be echoing. And so rather than have it come through on our podcast recording, I think we have enough. We have enough data to make our decision, so we'll go from there. Should I end mine? Well, it kicked you out, so I don't know where you are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All righty. So what are we talking about today? So we are um, dusting off our grief skills, and we're having a... uh, We're going to talk about grief today. Great. Grief episode. Um, Something I think we do pretty well. It is our area of expertise. Um, So we're going to dive back into it. A grief episode. We haven't talked about grief in a while on the show. Um, do you remember the last one we did? Was it community grief? Yeah, I think it was. Community grief, which is an um, interesting topic and something that we, um, you know, a lot of us deal with. But really, I think today we, we've done a lot of grief episodes about, um, you know, dealing with somebody in your life, somebody else that lost somebody how to support someone or how to support children, either grief in the classroom or pet loss. Um, but we haven't talked a heck of a, a whole heck of a lot about managing your own grief. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're going to do today. Right. Yeah. That is the plan. Do you have anything to kick us off with? No, you were supposed to do all the no, planning. I have yeah, You're like the interviewer. I know. <laughs> no, I, I just think um, it's helpful I'm, I'm noticing a lot lately that people are coming to me being like, what, what do I do with my own grief? Like, mm-hmm. what's normal? Um, and people that I'm seeing maybe a couple weeks to a couple months after their loss feeling a lot of uh, sort of pressure to feel a certain way. And, and so I think it was time to kind of go back to sort of the basics of, yeah. you know, grief your own grief journey, not like how do you support someone else? How do you support the community? How do you support children's grief? How do you support grief around a specific topic? But just kind of like, what do you do with your own grief? Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of people feel, and you have a blog article about this, and we actually did have an episode um, a while ago about this, but a lot of people feel abnormal. Yes. Talk about that. Well, I think our our culture puts the 
the pressure on people to feel abnormal, mm-hmm. right? Like the, the pressure that our society puts on grief or the griever is that you lose somebody, you're allowed to maybe cry, um, maybe lose it. Although then people will say like, oh, how is he doing? And she'll be like, well, you know, she's crying. So not really, it's not really doing well. So there's even pressure there in that right, like immediate right. space of grief. But then you're allowed to have a wake and a funeral, although the sort of expectation is that if you're having a really hard time, you should excuse yourself and like not fall apart in front of yeah. other people. Um, and then you can have a burial or a cremation or whatever sort of ceremony. And then take a few more days mm-hmm. to sort of be sad and, and grieve and then get back to work. Like don't talk about it. Don't cry don't have feelings just like move on and find closure and it's all baloney it's a bigger stronger word than that but we are not explicitly rated um but if we had an explicit rating i would use an explicit word because it's just not the way grief works so that's the pressure that's kind of put out there so when people are grieving and they feel like uh i don't feel normal like i I, I still, my heart is still broken. I'm not finding closure. I don't know how to move on. Nobody's talking to me about mm-hmm. it. Nobody's asking about him. Then they start to feel abnormal. Right. And I think that we, and we've talked about this in previous episodes, but we as a society, I think put a lot of pressure on the bereaved yeah. to tell us how we're supposed to mm-hmm. talk to them. Or, mm-hmm. you know, can you, um, you know, I, I don't know how to interact. I'm not sure what's going to work for you. And, and I think we put too much pressure on asking the bereaved, well, what is going to work for you? Or what do you need from me? And let me know if you need anything. We've right. talked about this before. Right. Um, I think it's important, you know, to remember that it, it's not their job to tell us what they need. Yeah, but remember we're talking about this from the perspective of the griever. Yes. Right? And so the reality is for the griever that that is the reality. So, how do, so let's, you know, we... Again, we've done a lot, I think a, a nice job giving people advice on how to support somebody who is bereaved. But let's flip it. How do I respond if I'm the person who just lost somebody and someone comes up to me and says, um, I'm not really sure what to say, or can you, I, I'm not sure, I don't feel comfortable. Um, you know, the reality is that um, the pandemic has sort of changed the way the funeral and wake process any of these memorial services go. So people feel maybe might feel uncomfortable being in a situation. So they say, hey, I don't feel comfortable coming into the funeral home to see you. Can you meet me before? What do we, how does the bereaved person respond to that, Jenny? Like what would advice would you give if one of your patients came to you and said, people keep asking me what to do. I don't know how to respond to them. Not just about that specific situation, but just... Gosh, I feel like you're asking me 17 questions right now. (laughs) Uh, Ask a question succinctly. What's the question that you want me to answer? Jenny, people keep coming to me and asking me what I need, but I don't want to respond to them. What do I say? Then don't respond to them. Like if, if that's... You just answered the question, right? It's the... You said... They keep coming to me asking what I need. I don't want to respond. Like, that's what you want. Mm -hmm. So the answer is you tell them what you want. Right. So it sounds like maybe in that instance, the the answer is I don't feel like talking to anybody or coordinating anything or seeing anybody. And so you as the bereaved, Mm -hmm. you pick one person to kind of be your gatekeeper and, and say to them, this is what I need from you. I need you to do all the talking to people, like be the mouthpiece, be the messenger, be the gatekeeper. Explain. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't, I'm not answering messages. I'm not returning phone calls. I'm not posting on Facebook. I'm not doing anything like that's okay. So the answer, the sort of, that would be the advice then. The advice is to do what you want, right? Like to identify that person that can speak for you. Mm -hmm. Well, in that specific situation, Mm -hmm. right? But the overall answer is what's the right thing for you to do and say as the griever, whatever you're feeling is the right answer, right? Like right. whatever you're feeling, if you're feeling like you want to see people and be around people and you don't want to be alone, then you speak up and you ask for that. If you do want to be alone and you don't want to see people, then you ask for that or you, right. you tell that it, unfortunately, because we as a culture don't do a great job supporting grievers. That is the reality for the grieving individual is to know that the people around you who you need to support you, probably don't have any idea how to do that and they're waiting for cues from you and it stinks 
but you have to give them cues. It's a tough situation. It's it's not fair. Yeah. Um, but so much of the research shows that you know that kind of is is what the cause of a breakdown in relationships after a death is, is that the grieving individual is let down by their support system because they didn't do what they needed. And the support system is feeling like they never told me what they needed. I just did what was helpful for me, or I read a magazine, or I just waited for cues from them. So there's like this disconnect and it stinks because ultimately it does put pressure on the the griever to say, this is what I need. That, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it's, it's the reality of the situation. It's the reality of the situation. Uh, you know, you can't have expectations that your support system is going to support you well. And often it's, you know, you, I sort of think of your, your support network as these sort of concentric circles, right? You've got like this inner circle of mm-hmm. the people closest to you. And then the next sort of circle is closer people, that next level out, and then so on and so forth. Right. Often it's the people in those like, external outer layers that wind up being better supports because maybe they're better educated or they went through it or they know. And so they kind of communicate that there's something, there's like not a disconnect that happens. Maybe it's also the expectations were lower for that sort of level of friends. And, and then there's some shifting that happens because the bereaved individual expects something so much more, so much more on target from their inner circle and, then they don't necessarily know how to do it. So communication is key, yeah. right? And and so for the support people, it's also key to say to the, the bereaved or, you know, if there is sort of a gatekeeper, like, I don't know what to do. What do they need right now? This week, today, the day of the wake, the day of the funeral, what do they need? Can right. I bring them breakfast? Can I be responsible for making sure they're hydrated? Can I watch their kids? Can I drive them there? Can I buy groceries? Can I send them dinner? Something like that. Right. Um, but asking someone specifically what they need. You talked about that on episodes before, rather than just say, Hey, let me know if you need anything. Mm-hmm. This is what I need to do for you. Let me ask you a question about what I refer to. And this could be completely wrong, but as, um, peripheral grief, like, um, you know, someone that has died that you, um, that your couple of people removed, like you're in that third circle, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Outside that, right. But you knew the person you, you had a lot of care and concern you for the person, but you're not in that inner, inner circle. Why do some people feel guilty about their own grief in that situation? And how do they manage that? Because they, they've, they've experienced a loss too. They're not in that inner circle, but they've mm-hmm. experienced a loss too. And I think that people tend to feel sad, feel guilty about being sad. Like, I'm not the spouse. I wasn't as close. So what right do I have to cry or be sad? I think people do experience that. I personally have experienced that. Sure. Well, I think also, you know, this comes up in in sessions. I work with a lot of um, healthcare providers and healthcare providers, whether they're doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, um, who feel grief when they lose a patient, right? Or when they're working with a patient and and there's just a patient that you connect with, right? And, And you've experienced this too, right? Like there's just some cases that sometimes you can identify why they they hit you harder and it's harder to not leave those ones at the door when you leave work. Sometimes it's because it reminds you of someone. Sometimes it's reminds you of you. Sometimes you can't really pinpoint what it is, but, um, But often there's this guilt, like, why? It's not my loss, so why am I feeling grief about it? Grief is not something people have ownership over. I mean, there is, um, there's sort of uh, rules around. So the theory about the fact that my word recall was worse when I wasn't eating has been debunked because I had breakfast this morning, but my (laughs) word recall is awful. That's okay. There's not... um, there's not. We have, a, we have a lot on our podcast plate today, so it, <laughs> that's all good. I have a lot on my plate, anyways. Um, there's there's not like rules or customs or what is the word I'm looking for? Someone out there in their car right now is saying know. it. You know, like you go to finishing school in the old days and you learn manners Custom. and um, etiquette. 
etiquette. Yay, Jenny. Yay. Um, there's no real like there's there's funeral there's etiquette around grief, right? Like you can't right. you, you can't be someone you know three layers removed and then post on Facebook like I'm so sad that my neighbor's cousin's friend lost their dog. I'm heartbroken. It's such a loss or, for me. And have people be like, I'm so sorry for your loss. Right, like right. that breaks or sort of the stand, etiquette rules. Like go stand in the receiving line. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But you can still feel your feelings, right? right you right. feel what you feel and that's okay. Like it doesn't, I say that to people all the time. If you feel angry, that's fine. Like there, there's no reason to not feel angry. So if something makes you feel really sad and you're catching grief from something, that's okay. That's normal. You have to think about how you express it, right? Mm-hmm. Your feet, you can feel what you feel. You and can feel, you, might be mm-hmm, you can feel really angry about something. It doesn't give you the right to go out and punch someone in the face, right? right? But you can feel your anger. So there's no rules around feelings. There's rules and etiquette around expression of those feelings, right, right. right? So you can't step onto Facebook or social media or step into the wake and the funeral and make yourself the central griever, right? right? But you can still feel your you still feelings. Feel it, you, okay. you just might have to sort of be, um, maybe a little bit uh, more thoughtful about where to put that grief, how to express that grief. Well, today's topic is managing your own grief. And we, we're we not saying that... I don't even know if I like that word, managing your own grief. Maybe understanding your own grief. Oh, that's good. Right, because I don't know that it's something you manage. So, yeah, so underst- that's a good, that's a better topic. So... Same topic, when, just when like like this, it's this kind of language, right? You, like this language, managing your grief, kind of like managing your anger, yeah, managing yeah, your employees. Understand. Like it's this like that's you better. should control your grief, but that's the language that's out there. I'm literally changing the name on my. Although I think my first viral article that I ever wrote, I think was titled "Managing Your Grief During the Holidays." It was. I think it was managing. Um, because tisk, that's what people, tisk, tisk, well, because that's what people search. Like, right. how do I manage my guilt, my grief? So when you clicked on this episode to play it today, all those listeners, uh, you should have clicked on one that said understanding your own grief. I like that topic a lot better. Yeah. The topic uh, title. Um, but when we decided to talk about this today, you know, we didn't, we weren't specifically just talking about the directly inner inner circle bereaved person it could be in that second or third circle that you were talking about it could be this somebody that this this close acquaintance but not somebody you saw every day or talked to every day i mean i think grief and and we've talked about this before but maybe folks haven't listened to every episode or it's been a while um grief is something you feel anytime you lose something you're attached to Right. To which you're attached. Right, right. So often it's a person because we form as humans attachments to other people. Mm-hmm. But you also can be attached to houses, relationships, jobs, routines. Right. And so I think there are probably a lot of people, if you're listening to this, still in the midst of some sort of pandemic setting where people could be grieving a loss of something to which they were attached without a death. So grief and all of those feelings can exist even without a death. I think that's important too, because people start to sort of struggle with like, why am I feeling this way? Like so often in a session, we'll sort of work through something and it'll start with the client talking about, um, feelings that sort of wind up looking like grief. And then at some point I, I say like, that's grief. Right. Like it's not a death, but you're grieving the loss of your marriage or you're grieving the loss of your ability to see your parents every weekend because of the pandemic. Or you're grieving the loss of a job that you had for 15 years that now you no longer have because you've been furloughed. Or you're grieving the loss of a routine where you could like get out of your house and see people every day. Right. That's all grief. And those grief is grief. The feelings are the same and the sort of needs are the same as well. Right. Well, I um, prep for us, um, and I looked at an article that I wanted to go through that has all these sort of myths about your own grief. And, you know, the first thing I want, before we dive into that, I did want to ask you about um, sticking with that topic, the element of that peripheral, like, um, outer circle person. Mm -hmm. You know, how would you, because this is still about understanding your own grief, because part of Grief sometimes includes guilt. We talk about that, um, right? So in sticking with that sort of peripheral um, outer circle person, let's say they come to you as a client or a patient, Jenny, and they say, um, I have all this guilt because 
I put myself in that circle, right? Like I was, I could have been closer. I could have had more time with this person or reached out to them. I got more. you. I like, put myself in the outer circle. I put myself there. Mm-hmm. How, did, how do they begin to do? So not only are they dealing with the loss, but also guilt about being in that circle. What would you, what would your first sort of piece of advice be? be to them i'm just putting you I'm putting you on the spot sorry yeah this is this is the rule josh and i have is that he does show prep and then he can't tell me the questions ahead of time right. um like i'm i'm being interviewed for another podcast later this week and they sent me the questions ahead of time and i was like oh i don't know how to operate that way i i operate kind of off the cuff here um on the fly on the fly so but what do you mean is they have guilt about not being there in that inner circle for the the bereaved or for the person that died for, per, for the person that died so this is the person like the folks that you know not in that inner circle that maybe like you guys were friends and then you like no longer worked together and you sort of drifted yeah. apart yeah exactly i mean that's grief that's i don't know that there's a way to deal with that other than to honor those feelings that you're not only are you then sad about the loss but you're sad about sort of the the You have guilt. You have sort of survivor's guilt in a way that you didn't maybe take advantage of the time or that maybe there was never time for things to get to a closer place. So in terms of advice, you've got to process those feelings, right? Like that situation, your relationship, your connection, the, the regrets maybe that you have, that all has to kind of be unpacked, right? Like when we're talking about processing your grief, processing any feelings about anything, it's sort of like... When I clean out my closet Mm -hmm. and and you've had these days, right? Where you walk into our bedroom and everything from my closet is all, (laughs) the room looks like it has had an explosion and everything from the closet, there's nothing in the closet. Everything is everywhere. Picture wading through like a swamp, waist high. That's what clothes and shoes and makeup and (laughs) everything, right? Like that's, that's taking everything out. And for the purpose of like reorganizing, processing and putting it kind of back together. And then the closet is, is cleaner after. Right. Right. But it's that in between period where you walk in and you're like, what did you do? Jenny, what is going on? And, and I'm like, it'll, it'll be okay. Processing everything. That's what it's like to sort of process grief and process your feelings. You've got to like get it all out. So all of those feelings of regret around the relationship changing and dynamics, those have to be sort of taken out, talked about, processed, looked at in whatever way, right? Maybe some people can do that on their own. Maybe some people need a therapist. Maybe some people need to do it with a friend, but it all needs to come out and be messy and ugly and you need to feel it and look around and be like, this is awful. It does not feel good to sit in this place. And then eventually as you process it, it kind of gets put back together in a neat way. But like closets, it can get messy again over time and you might need to sort of redo it. So we've talked about complicated grief a little bit on our show. And I have a question about that element, like that guilt element, having to unpack those things. Is that an, is that an example possibly of complicated grief? So it's like you're grieving the loss, but you've also all got these peripheral feelings that are connected, like this guilt about not being close to the person that died, not taking an opportunity to, you know, maybe um, see them as man- as much as you could, reach out as much as you could. So all this sort of additional stuff you're feeling, is that an example possibly of a, no. a complicated grief? No. No. Give me your dev not what you think complicated grief well, is. There's not. I'm just saying. Okay. No, yeah, no, complicated grief is like grief that become, that what you're describing is normal grief. Complicated grief but is. The, the, this guilt element. You said you're going to need to unpack those. But guilt some, is a very normal but feeling you can, in grief, you need to all grief. That with help, like no, going to see somebody. No, you could do that on your own. I mean, okay. some people. So it depends on how you process, right? Like some people are external processors, so so they might need to sit with someone, and maybe they don't have friends who are comfortable doing that or who sort of are skilled at doing that, and right. so maybe they would be better suited to process that with someone. Right, right. But maybe some people are internal processors and do better just kind of thinking about it and meditating about it and journaling about it or listening to podcasts about it. Right. So no, complicated grief is when your grief sort of your reaction to the grief starts to really spill into a more sort of mental health aspect, right? Like it triggers a depression or an anxiety, um, or, you know, it's, it's really, really prolonged and impacting other areas of your life. This, this guilt you're talking about, totally normal. Okay. 
totally normal. Guilt is, I think, one of the most overlooked feelings of grief. Mm. I think people think of grief and they think maybe anger and sadness. Guilt is huge. Yeah, it's very, very. And that's a very hard feeling so. to sit with. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering all those questions on the fly. You're welcome. Are we done? It. That no, is going to do it for. Oh. No. <laughs> we're going to take a break. Oh, okay. And we will be right back. Hey, Changing Perspectives fans, we have some very exciting news for you. How do you get even more Changing Perspectives delivered right to your inbox? By signing up for Jenny's new newsletter, of course. Jenny's newsletter includes great resources, tips, products, new blog content, podcast episodes, and much, much more. Visit JennyBrennan.com right now to sign up and be among the first fans to be notified of upcoming promotions and contests. That's JennyBrennan.com. Sign up now. And now back to the show. Hey everyone, welcome back from the break. Welcome back, Jenny. Thanks. Did you have a nice break? I did. Excellent. We're we doing this because you <laughs> muted my microphone. <laughs> we already had this. This feels very fake. Uh huh. <laughs> this is fake. <laughs> because, all right. So everybody, a little behind the curtain. While we were breaking, I put, I recorded an, a new ad. Um, for a new sponsor so we're really excited about that but i recorded an ad so i muted jenny's mic so she wouldn't be on the recording of the ad and i forgot to unmute her when we came back from the break for this episode at least she realized it yeah. pretty quickly i was like i don't really hear you in my headphones mm. and that's why anyway, okay all right welcome back so um in preparation for today's topic understanding your own grief i pulled up an article from helpguide.org entitled um, coping with grief and loss. Um, they have a list of these myths and facts about grief and grieving. So I figured we could go through them. Um, and I'm sure we've covered a few of these in previous episodes, but again, really talking about the bereaved person individually today, like mm -hmm. you're dealing with your own grief, understanding your own grief. Um, so as long as you're done with whatever's going on on your phone, would you like to participate in the episode? Yeah, nobody's seeing me, so I don't know why that was important <laughs> to do. <laughs> Uh, I thought it was funny. Good grief. What are you doing in your phone? Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm reading a message from our children's doctor. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I don't And I don't know how to. But I I remembered my login on my phone on the oh, first that's track. Exciting. That's Put your phone down Very now. exciting. Nope. That's great. I can do this. Okay. Okay. All right. So myths and facts about grief and grieving. The first myth they talk about is the pain will go away faster if you ignore it. What do, you, what do you think about that? That's a myth. Hold on. So I'm thinking backwards. So people say the pain will go away faster if they... Who says that? I don't know. People say, like, if you ignore it, you're going to feel better sooner? Like, don't think about it. Move on. Focus on something else. Okay. Uh, closure doesn't exist, right, Jenny? Closure does not exist. Closure is a myth. I right, Well, you have to remember to do the pre-COVID checklist. Okay. All right. Josh is yelling at me. <laughs> Put your phone <laughs> down. We're recording now. Um, that well, that's not a, that's not true well, at all. It's a myth. Yeah, it, I think people say that to make them feel more comfortable themselves. Did pe did people say that at some point? I think people do say that. I'm I'm really stuck on the ignoring it will make it go. I've never heard anyone say that before. Because that's my question. This article saying that that's a myth about grief is that if you ignore it, it'll go away. Yeah, no, you, you, the opposite of true, the opposite of that is true. If you, right. you have to feel the feelings, you have to process your feelings, you have to experience and express your grief, but it doesn't go away. Right. So, so there's no way to make it go away. Exactly. I guess is the point. I don't see an author on this. When is this article from? Our last episode, you had data from like 2008 and I was like, that is too old. This is from November of 2019. Okay, all right, okay. Fine. All right, that passes. This is written by Melinda Smith, uh, Lawrence Robinson, and Jean Siegel. They all they have a bunch of letters after their name, so I think they're experts. But um, they also listed a fact along with that. Each of these myths have a fact. I want to read the fact. It says trying to ignore your pain or keep it from resurfacing or surfacing will only make it worse in the long run. Uh, for real healing, it is necessary to face your grief and actively deal with it. So you have to feel your feelings is what you're saying. Always. Yeah, don't mm -hmm. ignore it. Otherwise, they're going to like sp spill out sideways. Right. Um, 
Yeah, I have a lot so, of sessions that focus ar- around that, right? Like people will come to me and they're experiencing, uh, you know, they're describing maybe they're feeling a physical sensations of anxiety or really low motivation or they're crying all the time or a whole host of things. And it turns out that what's going on is they're, su- Everett's here with us, they are suppressing their grief feelings and their body, their brain is like, uh, dude, you got to feel this. Mm-hmm. And so it's coming out in other ways. Right. You have to feel your feelings. Uh, I like how they said healing for healing to occur rather than closure for it to go away or for you to get over right, it. Right. Um, but there's no way to like make it go away forever. We talked before um, about the grief journey, right? Yes. Um, and remind folks what that like define the grief journey, Jenny. So that alludes to the fact that there is no closure. It doesn't go away. So right. what is the grief journey? I think that um, Elizabeth Kubler Ross did the grief field a great service Mm -hmm. by coming up with the stages the stages of grief and i think that people people learn that somehow like it seems like that's just sort of pop culture stuff um you know this belief that you have a loss you have a death and then you go through five stages right dabda denial acceptance bargaining depression no did i say acceptance denial anger bargaining acceptance is last right yeah depression and then acceptance right and so people sort of be like oh i'm in the denial stage right now or she's in the denial stage or he's in the anger stage oh i'm in the depression stage when am i going to get to the acceptance stage because then i'm right. done like i've taken this um path this sort of direction one direction from death to acceptance uh it's again expletive here not true and even Kubler Ross who developed the theory came out later and was like you guys totally misinterpreted that as she was approaching the end of her life with a terminal illness she's like that's grief is not linear there is no real such thing as acceptance so the the word journey is is really trying to take that kind of um, one direction direct path out of the conversation, right? Like rather it's different for everybody. How you experience grief, how it sort of stays with you in your life is different. It's a journey. It's your own individual journey. It's not a path. It's not a map. It's not a theory. It's just sort of the journey of your life, the journey of your grief. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And things stick with you and, you know, <clears throat> oh, well, we won't say names, but we'll talk about I'm talking about my grandmother for a moment. Mm. I don't think she'll mind. Um, she lost her husband very early, and at this point, over 40 years ago. Um, but we, you know, we recently chatted. We're chatting with her, and there's still like she vividly still remembers so many elements of what happened and the loss and everything. And it, and you know, she's still. Uh, have you had that conversation with her before? I don't think so. So like specific about about what? Do you yeah. Mean? Well, the, how she was talking about the most recent conversation. I hope we're not outing her. Um, do you remember? We like, love you. you. Were you thinking a lot of those same things that I was? What? Like like can it like I was thinking about where she is on her grief journey with with some of the things some of the things that she was sharing about the loss. Uh, no, I was just listening. I was just being present. But I guess I was I thinking, was too, I, I was walked away thinking like uh, in the all of the years that we've been together, I've never heard her talk about it, hmm. really. Like her, you know, the sort of experience after he died and the wake and the funeral and her feelings around that um, and who was helpful and, and all yeah, of that. I've, I've never heard that. So I was before. curious yeah. if you had heard it. I did. Yeah, I've heard a few of those stories before, but not as like a grief person. Um a death and dying expert. Mm. So not with sort of like the, the, the professional, the lens that you have on now. Yeah. It was interesting because the boys were there and they are teenagers. And so they, they were on their phones, you know, actually texting each other, which was nice. I was noticing them were having they? conversations about this new Batman movie and stuff, whatever yeah. other movies. Um, but they, uh, I noticed during that, that they like both sort of put their phones down and they were like really in the moment. Yeah. Um, They're good boys. And then, then she sort of came to a pause and she was like, all right, boys, let's talk about something else. Like she yeah. felt bad that there was this like grief death conversation around like 
teenagers, right? Because that's what our society does. Like, this yes. is a taboo topic. Yes. We're not supposed to talk about it. And we were both like, oh, it's fine. We talk about death and grief yeah. all the time. They're used to it. Um, and I actually think, like, the opposite is true. I think it's really important for families to have those conversations and for those stories to be passed down. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So I guess my point to bring her up, um, she's great. I talk about her all the time. But um, was talking about, like, the linear understanding of the stages yeah. like if you think about oh this death was over 40 years ago she should be well past acceptance right 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 but it's a journey and it's not meant to be linear. no and just like sort of the closet analogy right like anytime there's any other loss in in one's life it can trigger it right like decades later right whether it's mm -hmm. a loss that's similar or just I don't know, something any kind of loss can sort of re not trigger, but trigger, but like bring all of those feelings back up to the surface for right. you. And you have to reprocess them again. You've got to refeel them. So yeah. I guess getting back to your question around guilt earlier, sometimes people can have guilt around like the guilt, the grief I'm feeling, like the heaviest grief I'm feeling right now isn't about the grief around the person that I lost because maybe we weren't that close or, or whatever. It's about this grief that's been sort of re-sparked for me about a loss I had yeah. five years ago, two years ago, two weeks ago, three decades ago, right? That's yeah. a normal part of grief. And I don't think that we as a society give space for that to be okay. Right, right. No, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, are you ready to hear the next myth? I believe so. Okay. Well, I was a little nervous when you throw articles at me. That myth. first one threw me off. Okay, so the next myth is it's important to be strong in mm. the face of loss. Yeah, I hate that. Yeah, I, me too. And I know we all fall into that. Like, I think I said it too. You know, you, you roll up to like a, a wake or a funeral and you're like, stay strong. Yeah. Or just right now. Uh, press pause and go on Facebook and I'm sure that you know someone who knows someone who has passed away recently look through the comments someone has said stay strong yeah. um, you've got to be strong that's again expletive here uh, no Bogus. like why why right. why what that is such a crazy thing to say and what does that mean stay strong don't right. don't cry well, like, it does it mean that you're weak to yeah, feel it grief. insinuates the opposite is, is wrong or right. abnormal, right? So the, the, this, the article goes on to say that for the fact of this section, feeling sad, frightened, or lonely is normal. Yeah. Crying doesn't mean you are weak. Right. You don't need to protect your family or friends by putting on a brave front. Showing right. your true feelings can help them and you. Yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Like just the story we were talking about with my grandmother. Um, you know, she that moment when she was like oh we should stop talking about this in front of the boys because i you know that that translates in my mind to oh i gotta look strong right mm, no like, i think it was more about like well, this is a taboo topic right but you don't have to protect anybody it's okay it, it's more helpful just to, to your point mm -hmm. it's more helpful possibly to your family to share those things right. and, to, and to express your feelings and cry and be okay you know it's okay it doesn't mean that you're not str like there's no connection Right. I'm trying to think of an analogy with like food, but I can't think of one. I don't know. In the setting of mental health, Jenny, is anything like it, is the word strength or sh being strong? Is that part of any real when it comes to like a mental health journey or healing or anything like that? Any situation? Mm, I don't know. That's a good question. It seems counterintuitive to. Like um, sort of what does strength mean? Yeah. Like what does it mean to be right. strong? I think, I don't know. Maybe I don't like the word strong now that I'm thinking about it. I don't know. what. I guess that's my point. I don't know. It um, seems kind of weird thinking about like, you know, depression or yeah, having maybe stress I, or anxiety about yeah. anything outside of grief. Maybe I don't like that word because the, all, yeah. the opposite, the I antonym. I know that's <laughs> did I like did my eyes glaze over and I went to a different place um, the writing side of my brain kicked in yeah because uh, yeah, I think I think in order for me to maybe like that word or have a positive connotation around that word I have to then sort of not like the the opposite of that word right. and so what is the opposite of strong I think our culture thinks of it as you know weak, weak. like crying needing help needing support yeah maybe having depression or anxiety or maybe not being able to lift a hundred pounds. Like if we're thinking about it in terms of like physical fitness, but that's, I guess strength is relative. Mm -hmm. 
rather than sort of this uh, fixed thing. And so being strong for some, it can take some people's entire sort of limit of strength to get out of bed, to walk through the door of the funeral home and go to the wake of their spouse, right? Right, Like that can be strong, like that, they're very strong to do that. Yeah even if they're falling apart and crying right. and not able to right. sleep. So I guess that's, I think that's a dangerous word to say. So yeah. take that out. And if you are the griever and someone is telling you to be strong or stay strong, have compassion for them that they, they don't, they haven't listened they to this podcast. Yeah. Um, and they don't know how painful that word can be. Just quietly send them a link to change. Their perspective. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, they're just trying to say something supportive and that has been something that has become sort of this rote uh, phrase that people so, throw around. Right. And, but on the flip side, so the next myth says, if you don't cry, it means you're, you aren't sorry about the loss. Right. So the opposite. It's like if you're not, mm-hmm. you know, you're too, don't be too strong because it means you're not sorry, right? Right. Like how are they posting a funny meme right now on Facebook or, oh right. my gosh, why are they out to dinner? Yeah. It seems really hard to be a griever right now because yeah. there's all these sort of uh, potential areas for judgment around you. No, everybody grieves differently mm-hmm. and everybody grieves, has, you know, moments where they're devastated. They're on the floor, they're crying. They don't know how they're going to pick themselves up. And then other moments in that same day, maybe that same hour where their brain is able to sort of compartmentalize, shut it off a little bit. And they're able to like laugh with friends, yeah. right? That's normal. Um, some people are, are able to sort of go to a wake or a funeral and they've lost a child or their partner or a parent to whom they were really close and not shed a tear. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't show us sort of level of feelings. It just means like, Oh, that's just what they're doing right now. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, well, the article goes on to share the fact about this and says crying is a normal response to sadness, but it's not the only one. Yeah. Great point. That says that is said much yeah. better than what I said. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> Those who don't cry may feel the pain just as deeply as mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. They may simply have other ways of showing it. Yeah. yeah. Or they may be all cried out for that period right, of right. time, right? Like maybe they were sobbing hysterically before that. So next myth. Are you ready? I'm ready. Grieving should last about a year. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. False. Fake news. There's no end. There is no end. Right. No. It's it's forever. And it can, you know, catch you off guard, you know, like Mm -hmm. 40 years later or four months later or a year later or a holiday. Right. Like. So I know that everybody grieves grieves differently and, you know, calling back to your article, am I normal? Yes. Everything you're feeling is normal. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, when does it spill into needing additional help? Like when is it, you know, when does it spill over into the complicated grief area of, you know, being sort of stuck maybe for too long or un- unable to let, let's connect us to when someone should seek out additional help. I think you're throwing around complicated grief a lot and you're using it as a synonym for um, I am a cinnamon, cinnamon, a synonym for um, for someone who needs support getting through grief, and uh, that's not what no, it is. I'm just trying to. Can we can we take complicated grief out of it? Because I don't want people to make this link between thinking like if I need to go to a support group or if I need a that's therapist, why I, it up. Like, I must have complicated grief. Right, right. Like that's that's something different. Let's. Can we remove the word complicated grief? That's normal grief. So needing professional help to process a loss is normal. Is not complicated grief. No. Okay. It's normal. Right. And especially when we live in a culture who does a really bad job right. teaching people how to support friends and family through grief. Totally normal. So I, I really want to sort of uh, distinguish That's those great. two. Like That's like really Tear those apart. Yes. Like if you say right. complicated grief again, I'm going to throw something at you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's one way. Uh, yeah, that's my, yeah. I, I'm multitasking. Let me multitask. Back off. Doing? Nobody needs to know that I'm multitasking. But I feel like you're not paying attention. Our child has an appointment in the morning and I was supposed to pre-check in like yesterday. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ding, okay. ding, ding. All right. Um, What's the question? I was multitasking. I didn't hear f- it. 
I'm kidding. The fact <laughs> that they uh, share in response to the grieving should last about a year. It says there's no specific time frame for grieving, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. How long it takes differs from person to person. I, well, I would say how long it takes is forever. It's never right. It's never fully gone, right? right? There's never like a time where you're like, all right, I'm never going to cry about that loss again. I'm never right. going to think sadly about them. I'm never going to go through a birthday, Christmas, holiday, anniversary, family party, someone else's loss, momentous occasions in our children's lives. I'm never going to go through any of those and be grief stricken again. That's what do you say? Not true. How do you respond to a grieving person who asks you say they're a client of yours and they say well my my best friend or my relative told me that okay now it's time to move on like how do you respond to that what is your best friend's or relative's training in grief (laughs) right right and they're probably going to say like "Mm, well they say well they come to you and say jenny were they right is it time for me to move on no i would say they're absolutely wrong okay they're probably still great people and they mean well and they want to see you not hurting and they have this understanding that grief is finite and ends, but it's wrong. And, and describe or define move on. What does that mean to you? And does it mean that you don't, you're not getting sad anymore or? Yeah, move on is just not a thing. It's not a thing. Not a thing. So there's no there's, moving on. There's never time. There's never going to be a time where you have to move on. Mm-mm. Right. Yeah, Never. Well, that was a nice unplanned segue into the final myth. But you knew about the myth, so... No, I didn't, actually. Oh. I you... read through, like, the first three, and I was like, oh, this will be good. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, la- the last one says, uh, moving on with your life means forgetting about your loss. <sighs> no. So they you reference... Never, you they never reference forget that. On, so. Yeah, you never, ever forget the loss. No. Um, and actually... A lot of the sort of postmodern research on, on grief talks about the importance, not in terms of moving on, but the importance of terms of, of healing or getting to what feels like a more comfortable place for you with your grief. The importance of actually incorporating that person in their memory in your life, like right. a daily basis, whether it's like um, a tree that you plant, a garden that you plant, a necklace of theirs that you wear, um, going to the cemetery having a photo of them right like there's it's actually better to not forget them right um so the opposite of of that is true but but i think that's a myth that a lot of people do perpetuate like you've got to take all the pictures of him down and you've got to like you've got to put all of his clothes away you've got to get new comforters you've got to um stop talking about him you have to you know do all of that like erase him from your life Mm. so that you're never reminded of the loss no no. The, the opposite is kind of the opposite. Yeah. Kind of the opposite is true. Well, and it, like figuring out what works for you. It's um, you talked about that before, Jenny. It was uh, what was what's the phrase? That you you call that a, um, some sort of honoring or perpetual like. Oh my gosh! Um, what is wrong with me? I, me too. I can't think of continuous bond. Continuous bond. Yeah. yeah. Um, like the same blanket or um, you referenced a, um, someone had taken t-shirts from the person who died uh-huh. and made a blanket or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, the fact that they share about this um, last myth is moving on means you've accepted the loss, but that's not the same as forgetting. You can move on with your life and keep the memory of someone or something you lost as an important part of you. In fact, as we move through life, these memories can become more and more integral uh, in divining the people we are. And I had a question for you about the bereaved person. And I find myself doing this every now and then, probably more when I was younger, but, um, you know, maybe you by yourself, you're in the car or you're doing yard work or just whatever. And, you know, and you find yourself talking to the dead person, like out loud. Oh. How do, you know, I guess walk me through, obviously that's normal, mm-hmm. right? That's okay to be doing that. Yeah, well, and I think it depends on your um, your kind of religious and spiritual beliefs, right? right like right. if you are someone that it believes in like a heaven or an afterlife or spirits or souls, then you, you believe that you are able to communicate, that like they're on some other side yeah. and they're able to hear you. Right. 
But there are lots of people that will go sit at a cemetery and talk to their loved one at the cemetery. Right. And, and part of that is, you know, because they believe that they can hear them. Part of that is because they might not know for sure what they believe, but it feels good to sort of externally process and yeah. have them be a part of their life and do something kind of normal that feels normal, which is to talk to that loved one and kind of imagine what they would say. Yeah, I like that um, as a way to sort of have that continuous bond, right? Like. Mm-hmm having that connection that you can go to wherever you, whenever you need to. Mm -hmm. Um, And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, if you're not religious or if you don't go to church or whatever, you can still have that. It doesn't have to be like, oh, um, you know, I can only talk to them if I believe them to be in heaven. Right. No, there's there's people that I work with that uh, will send emails to their loved one Mm. or, um, you know, they still have their phone number so they'll text them or they'll write them letters. Uh, Really totally normal and and really helpful. Um, There's also a a Rogerian technique, uh, the empty chair technique, where you, in, in a therapy situation, but you could also do this in your real life, where you, you sit like on a couch or a sofa or a chair, and you pull up an empty chair, and you imagine that your loved one is sitting there with you, yeah. and you talk to them. You're talking to the empty chair, but it can be so incredibly powerful. And I often say with my clients, you know, if they're talking about something, and they're in sort of a grief space, I will say, what would your loved one say? Like if you were to ask them the question you just asked me, what would they say? Because if it's someone really close to you and there was a positive relationship, you know, you. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so sometimes that's really powerful to kind of allow yourself to have that kind of exchange relationship thought process where you're allowing yourself to sort of imagine a conversation with that person. Right. Like it it allows you to feel connected. Right. And that's healthy. That's not, you know, other people might think like, that's crazy. She's like pretending her mom's in the chair and she's dead no that's super healthy right like how great is it that she is getting those feelings out and processing things and being like real and honest with her feelings she's willing to kind of like weed through the the messiness of pulling everything out of the closet in the hopes that the stuff's going to kind of go back in and maybe not feel quite so overwhelming that makes me think of uh, ozark and the character's father. Wow, don't, don't spoil things. Yeah, but no, someone experienced a loss on Ozark and... I don't remember this. Yeah. Um, Someone's father. Yeah. Hmm. Keep going. Maybe it'll make sense to and, me. And, you know, he kept showing up, like, in the car, in his trailer. And oh, he was yes, yes. Uh-huh, to him. Uh-huh. And I think that that was really good for the character in this grief. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting one because mm-hmm. I wonder if people watched it and thought like, "Ooh, that he's character crazy. is going crazy." Oh, he's not no, a, that's, that's like not really. Normal. And he was envisioning what that character would have said yeah. to him. You're right. It what? That's a great example. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. Good callback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Well, uh, I like this article a lot. We'll share this. They do also have some uh, tips on how to deal with the grieving process. I just want to say, uh, bring up one of them, and they said, "Acknowledge your pain." Right. Yeah. Understand that your grieving process will be unique to you and that it's okay. Like everything you're like, everything you're feeling is normal for you. It's normal because everything is re- relative to you right? and everything you're feeling is okay. Right. And you don't have to be strong. It's not going to end. You don't have to move on. You just have to be and it's okay. And kind of, you don't have to worry about other people's feelings, yeah. right? Like right. I don't want to step on anyone's toes or I don't want, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say no to someone like that. You have to not worry about the other people's feelings. Right. Like this is a time where um, it's okay to 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 take care of yourself. I mean, it's yes. always a time to a good time to take care of yourself. Self-care but really, not selfish, you need to be worried about, loss. especially in a setting of a loss. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and it's okay. It's really important, I think, to to tell people what you need to give yourself that permission. Yeah. And, and to take people up on their offer, right? So if yes. you do have someone who said, let me know if you need anything and you're sitting at home alone and you're like, I don't know how I'm even going to like go grocery shopping this week. Like think about maybe being vulnerable and asking yeah. for some help. I mean, you know, you, you might have someone say and no, you know or you might have someone who is able to really kind of give you what you need, but yeah. they're not going to be able to do that if you don't direct them. And it's a lot easier these days for people to do that through like Instacart and things like DoorDash and ordering on behalf of somebody like you literally don't have to get out of your house 
to buy groceries for somebody who's bereaved. True. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But that person who's bereaved might want the company. Right. That's true. Too. That's sort of like yeah. um, closed ended company. Like I'm going to come bring your groceries and help you put them away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to leave. Right. Like that. Right, that right. might be helpful. Yeah, that's a good point. Good advice. Mm-hmm. Anything else to add? I think we're at the end of our time today. Uh, I guess to add, usually I say no. Oh, um, I'm surprised. I know, I know. <laughs> I keep you on your toes. Go ahead. Um, that it's okay to reach out for help. Like there, oh gosh. Oh, so Everett is Everett's so done. bored. That was his, <laughs> that he just literally groaned. He was like, oh, mom is not done. We have another episode to record. You I know. Get ready. He doesn't know that. <laughs> um, it's okay to reach out for help. It doesn't mean that you're broken. It doesn't mean that you have complicated grief. It doesn't mean that you're depressed. It may, might just mean that like you process things better with someone's support. Um, and so it's okay to get grief support. It's okay to go see a grief therapist. It's okay to go to a support group. It's okay to order some books off Amazon. I, I have some books on my website. If you go to jennybrennan.com resources shop and scroll down, there's some books on grief. Um, and, and there's a lot of them there because it's not one size fits all. I always yeah. tell folks like, look at the reviews, like flip through the description and, and buy one or two that speak to you or get them from your local library that speak to you. Although I would recommend buying them cause you, you're going to want to go back to those books. Um, but like, that's okay to do. Yeah. It's okay to say like, I need help right. through this. Cause this is, this is hard. And until our society does a better job, We've we've got to look for some extra support, right? And well said. Jim. And cut your friends a little bit of slack. Your friends and fam- family, you're probably going to be disappointed by something they say, something they don't say, something right. they do, something they don't do. Um, try to remember that that's not an indication or a reflection of how much they care about you or love you or don't or how important you are, but rather it's a reflection of their comfort and education around grief. Right. Great points, Jenny. Thanks. All right. Anything else? No, that was it. Okay. That was really it. Well, um, hope you enjoyed this one, everyone. Hope it was helpful. Um, these grief episodes, you know, something Jenny and I obviously are passionate about. Not only do we care about a lot, we actually um, kind of do this for work, too. So we, um, you know, we're happy to be able to bring this stuff to you. And we hope it is helpful. But that is going to do it for today. So thank you so much for listening. For today's show notes links, you can check out helpguide.org, uh, Coping with Grief and Loss, a um, little bit of a sort of self-care, understanding your own grief there. As a reminder, this episode was for education and entertainment purposes only. Should you need additional support, please contact your healthcare provider for information and referrals. Please follow us on Facebook, everybody, at Changing Perspectives Podcast. And on Instagram at Changing Perspectives Blog. You can send us an email at changingpodcast at gmail.com. You can also visit our website by going to changingperspectivesblog.com. And while you're there, don't forget to visit the shop to check out all of that Changing Perspectives merchandise. <laughs> Heavy. I never really wants you to go check out the shop. Uh, and as Jenny mentioned, uh, you can also check out some of those books on grief that are available there as well. Okay, everybody, go ahead and subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. And we. We'll see you next time. Say bye, Jenny. Bye, Jenny. The Changing Perspectives podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Dizzy Bird Studios. Copyright 2020. Please visit Dizzy Bird Studios on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Dizzy Bird Studios.